All right, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Bull Sessions, the June 15th, 2021 edition. We've been doing this now for almost a year, and we'll be talking about that in a minute. My name is Mark Robertson. I'm uh, joined here by Kim Butcher, our special guest, guest damsel extraordinaire. Good afternoon, Kim. Good afternoon. I don't know about extraordinaire, but I, I'm just, uh, I, I, I'm a girl who likes to invest and and understand the stock market. We'll just take it and run with it. <laughs> um, Ken, Ken was going to try and join us, but he is on the road, and it's a pretty good chance that he won't be joining us. But uh, we'll send good thoughts and vibes in his direction as he's rolling down some sunny highway somewhere. All right, let's go ahead and get underway. Some of the stuff that we want to cover, I thought we would expand on last week's topic with uh, something I'd kicked around with a few people privately, this notion of DevCon levels and, and how, how to look at the market with some of the indicators we talked about a week ago. Do you want to check in on the Bare Naked Million? Uh, it's coming up on its 15th birthday and uh, having a pretty good run. And that has been probably one of the more powerful inspirations that we have in our arsenal for getting people to notice investing. And Kim is going to return us to the library with a, a book that uh, has come by their book club. Then we'll cover that and we'll add another potential book listing to our favorite all-time books on investing. Anything else you want to add at this point, Kim? Nope, that covers it. All right. Bear with me if there are any technical difficulties and I disappear for some reason. Um, I'm just going to go lay in the sun and I'll see you a week from now. <laughs> All right, here's to get our disclaimer out of the way. No investment recommendation is intended. Every time we do one of these sessions, whether they're roundtables, educational sessions, bull sessions, successful investing, webcasts, they are about education. And everything that we do in this realm is uh, intended to be a demonstration or an illustration of the philosophies of the modern investment club movement as interpreted by Manifest Investing and as championed by the National Association of Investors, also known as Better Investing. We'll express some opinions here. Uh, we do try to remember to acknowledge and admit when we own something that we're talking about. Um, but please do your own homework and make your own decisions. If you'd like to be added to a roundtable reminder list, those are the monthly webcasts that we do on the last Tuesday generally of every month. And that's a session where four or five of us get together and share a single favorite investment idea and walk through at least a partial analysis of how we look at it in this community. If you'd like to be added to a roundtable uh, reminder list, again, please email nkavula1 at comcast.net. If you like copies of the slides, if you have follow-up questions or suggestions for future topics, you just heard Ann Manning remind us to put alerts on the agenda. We will do that. Send an email to markr at manifestinvesting.com. All right. Here's kind of our standing agenda. We've been doing this, like I said, for almost a year. And uh, Frankly, I was kind of taken back by the those little entries that you see there on the lower right. Some of the stuff that we've talked about during these sessions, and that's actually a, quite a partial list. Um, just the notion of, you know, Don Draper talking about the advertising industry or Kramer's COVID-19 index or the analysis that Hugh and I did of companies like Tesla. And, uh, of course, our projected return on value stuff that we have aired out relative strength index, you know, and the the reference I just made to Lady Di and the Bare Naked Million. We're going to talk about the Bare Naked Million in a minute, but um, it really comes down to a powerful demonstration that you don't have to be hyperactive as an investor to be incredibly successful by anybody's perception and uh, just good stuff all around. So we are going to talk about bare naked ladies meet Lee, Lee Majors. By the way, one of you guys asked me, how come you're always tossing around people like Robin Williams and Lee Majors and Don Draper? A lot of times I do that just because I know that I'll be able to I'll be able to use that for future searches. Because you're basically date stamping or name stamping or some type of uh, image visualization stamping 
the moment. So now if five years from now, I'm trying to remember what, you know, when we got together and talked about this, uh, a manifest investing site search on Lee Majors is going to find this. So that's one of the roots of my weirdness. Kim is very familiar with that. Yeah, and at least it's better that way, Mark. My way that I remember thing is, what was I eating when we were talking about that? You just can't <laughs> find or smell, you know, a, a certain smell or a certain food. You don't find it by searching. Well, you know, it's it's not that unusual. You know, I know you're a big music fan. A lot of times, we actually remember moments in time by the music that was playing, uh, and it's not that unusual a thing to to use and take advantage of when it comes to a search. So, anyhow. All right, and we're also going to talk about, let's just expand a little bit and just kick around this notion of where are we in the marketplace today and this notion of DevCon levels and, and a little bit of rationalization as to why I think where we're at in this cycle. A lot of people seem uh, pretty committed to the notion that we're in a bubble and headed for demise and uh, not sure I see that. That could happen. I could be wrong, but I'm not sure I see that. And we'll just kick around some other stuff here, but you can see other entries on the list that we will get to in future sessions. Any comments or questions at this point? I just want to remind everybody, if you have anything that you think we should discuss, please send a note to Mark. So we're not mind readers. And if there's something you think that would really be great to the whole community here, please share. I'll second that motion. All right. Well, here's a slide that I could basically leave in the presentation and hide it or unhide it on a weekly basis. Yeah, since the last time we were together, we have set a new high in the S&P 500. And again, we made the point in the past, that's basically our job or our experience, or as we call it around here, another Tuesday. So don't get too excited about it. It's certainly not anything to worry about. There are new highs impossible things are happening every day. All right, here's a quick look at one of our favorite charts and then we'll launch into a, a discussion here in a few minutes of uh, some other indicators and how they all stack up. But again, what you're looking at here from left to right, the green bars are the stock prices as measured by the average stock in the value line arithmetic average. And that index or average or however you want to look at it that arithmetic average is actually approaching a value of 10,000 right now and uh, that's what you see up here and this this whole group of green bars and what you see here on the far right yeah we have had quite a run since a year ago actually almost 18 months ago now in total but uh, from the, the troughs that we were in 18 months ago to now uh, uh, there have been very few 18 or two 18 month or two year periods in stock market history like we've been through and uh, so those price charts have have taken off pretty well the fact that they're above the blue line does say that we might be a little bit uh, pushing the envelope a little bit the red dots are the value line median appreciation projection again think of it as, as if you stacked up all 1700 companies that are in the value line standard edition did a stock selection guide on them and came up with a, a median appreciation for all of them. So you see those two moments in time where there were peaks and you can see that we're basically sitting down near, uh, you know, relatively historical levels. You see the last 20 years displayed here. We went all the way back to the 1960s last week and, and basically showed that it has gotten a little bit lower, you know, drifting down into these levels in the past, but we are, you know, relatively, low when it comes to the return forecast or the expectation from the average stock right now. Of course, the blue line is just a Microsoft Excel driven regression. And uh, that is a, a gently sloping curve to the upside, reflecting a growth rate of approximately 10%, uh, if you actually solved for it. All right, any comments or questions at this point, Kim? No, it's just, you know, the other thing is, is we never know what the crystal ball is going to show for us, but I don't know. I think we're getting into a kind of a consolidation mode here personally, and I don't know when it's going to switch out of that, but I still think we have a lot more to go up rather than down. Yeah, I I wouldn't be the least bit surprised to see what Kim was talking about is relatively a, 
a flat spot or a plateau in stock prices for a while. And then that could certainly happen. No doubt about that. All right. Pressing on, I thought we would sneak in a Groundhog update. Uh, I worked really hard to get my name on here, Kim. I had tried to get yours on there, too. It couldn't quite make it. What you are looking at here for the first time are the 52 market-beating entries out of the 144. Um, again, I was number 40 last week, so that tells you what kind of – or two weeks ago, I guess. Uh, so that tells you what, what how I've done here over the last few weeks. But, uh, again, a lot of names that we look forward to, to seeing in person in the not-too-distant future. Uh, Joel Bryan is still up near the top of the list, uh, as are some of our other uh, people we've talked about in past sessions. And the new leader is Terry Greisinger of uh, Pittsburgh. And uh, more on that in a, in a second here. She's actually pulled out to a, a fairly sizable lead over Captain Joe out of Chicago. The average return has snuck up to near 5%. Again, uh, with only 36% of our contestants beating the market, that's a little bit low. That has improved from, from where it was, but it's still, uh, still down there a bit. And just for fun, and a reminder that the stock market is a great humiliator. Uh, the, the hottest mutual fund manager on the planet for the next, next last seven years, Kathy Wood and her ARK Innovation ETF, A-R-K-K -K is the symbol. She would be 142nd. She's actually moved up one notch from 143rd, but 142nd out of 144. So, again, it's just a reminder of the power of the great humiliator and the stock market in general. So, just some good clean fun. Any comments on this, Kim? Well, the only positive thing I can say out of looking at all this, you and I are both on the Manifest Investing Roundtable. So we are on this dashboard, maybe not as an individual, but we are there. That's true. I, I'm often forgetting that. What Kim's referring to is that entry right there in the middle of the chart that says Manifest Investing Roundtable. Those were our selections from February or March probably February, and uh, we are hanging in there pretty well. I will once again point out that we do have a fairly large number of investment clubs showing up on here in these uh, market-beating clubs, and uh, some of them have been near the top many times over. Bauer City, that's Susan Michalik's gang out of, Bowers, out of uh, Janesville, Wisconsin, and those Wichita entries are John Kimmel's. Uh, clubs out of out of Wichita and they have both been group winners in the past of course Ken's still hang, hanging in there at 32 he likes to celebrate those moments so there's your groundhog update here's a little bit of an extended update um, I mentioned Terry Greisinger who's taken over the lead she actually passed away within the last month or so and uh, she's from Pittsburgh she's actually was a member I believe of the club we lost Nick Stratagos about a year ago and her Barnett also and I consider all of them to be Groundhog royalty um, uh, Nick and her Barnett will rank among the all-time leaders because they're there uh, forever uh, when it comes to the Groundhog challenge we don't just keep track of the uh, the results of one year as we've been doing here this in fact is a little over four months we actually keep track of all 15 years, and Nick was in the top 10, I believe, the last time we looked for all-time historical performance. And, uh, again, just a nod to Nick and his multiple selections of five below, which live on in many of our portfolios, and uh, some unforgettable presentations over the years. Your thoughts, Kim? He would find stocks. I don't know where he found them or how he did, but I, he was always somebody I had to wake up and take notice because he he had the touch. He did have the touch. He did. He came up with some interesting ideas. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Nick was involved in the discovery of 2-6 many years ago. That's a Pittsburgh company, or at least a uh, Pennsylvania company, Western Pennsylvania company. And uh, uh, he did the... He's among the people that have been real idea idea generators over the years. So, again, a tip of the hat to Terry and Nick and uh, her Barnett. And uh, 
they will never be forgotten. All right, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about this Bare Naked Million. Those of you that have been around for uh, several months know that I used it for a moment in time to talk about Lady Di and uh, a friend who had really struggled with investing and, and some churning and a whole bunch of lackluster efforts when it came to investing over multiple decades. And I basically used this portfolio to convince her that you don't have to buy and sell a stock every morning. And uh, what the what the the bare naked million portfolio represents is a call that I received back almost 15 years ago between Christmas and New Year's Day. Um, again, a little almost 15 years ago that said, "What would you do with a million dollars?" And I, my answer to the question was, "Well, first of all, I think I'd take approximately half of it and put it in something like Vanguard Growth." So Vanguard growth, you know, when you have an investment in Vanguard growth, you are pretty well diversified across a number of uh, pretty exceptional growth, high quality companies, you know, including, you know, your Johnson & Johnson's, Apple's, Intel's, you know, all of those type of companies, not just technology, but growth across the board and most of it blue chip. And you can see that that uh, approximately $500,000 investment in Vanguard growth has become almost $3 million all on its own. So that million dollars is now just crossed the $6 million threshold. In fact, when I started to do the slide, we were at 5999 and uh, the market cooperated yesterday and put us over 6 million so that we could bring in Lee Majors, the $6 million man. So you can see what uh, the current condition of the portfolio is. We'll talk about when we selected in a minute, but the whole premise is, you know, you buy something like a Vanguard growth and then you basically supplement it with a bunch of, you know, world-class or best in, best in industry leaders and you just buy them and hang on to them for as long as it makes sense to do so. Our definition of that is for as long as they have a projected return greater than money market rates. And you can see that that's true for all of the companies in the portfolio right now. We did add Motley Fool small cap growth just because we were finding so many opportunities a little over a year ago in small small uh, companies. We wanted to have that. So this is an ETF which actually achieves that and has a pretty good looking, notice the growth rate, sales growth forecast for the average company in that portfolio. And uh, although it's not setting the world on fire with respect to either the growth rate, that's still not too bad at 9.9. .9, and the par is above the median company right now. Great to see that higher. But again, we just kind of sit back and let this thing chug away. And uh, so the premise uh, 14 years ago was buy Vanguard growth and then the rest of these that you see here uh, up at the top. And um, back in that time frame, we basically chose some industry leaders in December 2006. Actually, I need to sneak down here. We basically still own seven out of the ten, um, seven or eight out of the ten uh, um, since that since that day. So we have not actually sold any of those positions. Now, the ones in highlighted in yellow were exited. For a variety of reasons usually um, they've done pretty well you can see that some of these returns are actually pretty good like lows lows and night transportation and the others were probably on some type of fundamental weakness uh, jensen did not do as well as we had hoped it would do but they've been replaced over the years by these down here and again i think the key point is we're talking 14 years and seven selling transactions and as you can see, there are a number of years there where there were no transactions at all. So it's really kind of uh, astounding to me, and it's especially astounding, trust me on this one, you, you, if, you're, if you're talking to somebody who has dabbled in trading or investing frequently, and they see something like this, it just knocks them out. It takes me back to uh, my days with the investment club in Chicago, some of you heard the story, so I'll give the nutshell version of it. Um, you know, we had a friends and family club in Chicago, you know, met monthly, all the traditional investment club stuff. And I was also attending sessions of the American Association 
of investors there in Chicago. And uh, a couple of the members uh, were just sitting around having a Coke after one of the meetings. And I was talking about our portfolio and it behaved similar to this. I mean, very few sell transactions. And uh, his name was Bob. Bob basically was saying, well, he's selling one or two minimum stocks per week and basically generating average results. And, and you know, so I basically told him about the club. I said, you know what? Uh, we have approximately 20 stocks in the portfolio. We go entire years without selling a single position. And he couldn't believe it. So he began attending our investment club meetings. And what he witnessed was you don't have to sell all that often. You can you basically hang on for as long as it makes sense to do so. And uh, we changed him. I mean, he basically became more of a buy and hold for as long as it makes sense to do so investor. And uh, it, it basically changed him. And then if you want to go back to approximately a year ago when we talked about Lady Di, same thing with her. She is just cranking her along now, barely looking at her portfolio. She's loaded up on VUG, QQQ, and a couple other index uh, exchange traded funds. And she has a handful of personal favorites, most of them in technology, because that's where she worked for for many years. And uh, again, not doing a whole lot of selling and uh, achieving, uh, at least for her, extraordinary returns. Your thoughts, Kim? I think it's the simplest thing that you can do is to have a great portfolio because and, and you sleep well at night because Munger says, and one of his quotes is, the most difficult thing to do is to sit on your hands and do nothing. And most investors are detrimental to themselves because they do buy and trade too much. And I'll be, I'll be the first to admit it. it took me a long time that every time I thought I was going to buy or sell something that I shouldn't, and I've sat on my hands more often than not, that has been the absolute right decision to not do anything. So, you know, we all want to have returns that we can um, sleep at night with and make sure that we have enough to have, I mean, I, I'm sure everyone else does, I want to have as much income in my portfolio coming in equal to what I made going to work. And I have to admit, it's a heck of a lot easier just being home and helping family and making the same kind of money yearly without having to go to work and someone else controlling my time. Absolutely. It's, it's the very definition of freedom, probably something we'll talk about between now and July 4th for sure. All right. So let's spend a little bit more time with this concept of what is the true condition of the market based on a variety of things that we look at. Now, I apologize. The slide's a little bit busy. It actually goes back and touches on a few things that we talked about last week, but it's the answer to a question posed to me, you know, if, if you could put a DEF CON level on you know, where the market is right now, what would it be? And starting with the DevCon 1 level of low, where that would basically be down here at the bottom, uh, a situation where it's back up the truck. And what I've done is just basically included that first chart, chart that we talked about a few minutes ago. When we have moments where the return forecasts on the stocks that we study uh, are populating those green bubbles up at the top, those circles up at the top, those were back up the truck moments, you know, back after the Great Recession. Again, I don't know what was so great about it and why we keep calling it the Great Recession. But back in November 2008 and March 2009, you can go back and read what we wrote. We basically said we are in a back up the truck moment like we have rarely seen. Back at the same time, in the same time frame, Warren Buffett made the comment that he hoped he lived long enough to have another one of these. In other words, an opportunity to find intense bargains in the stock market. And lo and behold, we basically had that a year ago. So that's what a back up the truck moment looks like and uh, a DEFCON level of one on the chart. Guarded, that's where we are most of the time with a, a median return forecast somewhere in the upper single digits. We're currently right around 6 to 7% for the average stock right now. So again, that's not off the charts to the downside, but it is uh, relatively low 
uh, compared to where we've been normally. So we would tip, typically to be guarded, we would want to be closer to that 10% historical return level. And uh, we're, we're probably at the upper end of guarded when it comes to the return forecast on, on stocks that we're looking at. One of the indicators that I, I talked about last week, first of all, this one here, the number of new highs versus new lows this is an important one just for saying that, you know, in general, there are still opportunities out there and we are still setting new highs in a number of stocks. So the market is cranking away. Profitability, the second one, is projected to be quite good. So fundamentals are going to get a kick. Um, I don't know whether that will come home to roost, but even if some of it comes home to roost, you're talking about unprecedented levels of profitability in the next three to five years. And the third one, which I didn't talk about much last week, but this was featured pretty pretty neatly in uh, Jim Cramer's latest book on investing, or his next to latest book. Um, that's taking a look at the employment characteristics. And uh, if you if you take a look at the basically nine years of employment characteristics coming up here to where we fell off the table a year ago, everything was strong. I basically disregard everything between here and here as an outlier. In fact, Hugh McManus and I have had extensive conversations about how the data is so skewed and and distorted that I'm not sure you can even use it. We are basically bouncing back to those levels fairly rapidly. And uh, I think we'll get there even more rapidly as we wean some of the the government assistance here in the not too distant future. Some states have already begun doing that. We talked about that last week a little bit. But uh, when, you, when you're driving around in, uh, at least in our neck of the woods, I'm not sure how it is in Florida, Kim, but you can't, you can't leave the house without running into a help wanted sign in our neck of the woods. You can't do it here, and there's bonuses to get to workers at McDonald's and bonuses to get them in many different places $300, $500. Yep. Yeah, we played tennis last night, and we were, um, my wife had a craving for Taco Bell. And we discovered that Taco Bell, which is normally, uh, I believe, 24 7, is closing at 8 o'clock at night. So we had to look far and wide to find a place that was still open after playing last night so and the reason is they can't staff the places yeah so exactly. that's that's at 17 dollars an hour with uh i think either a 500 or thousand dollar signing bonus so yeah i think i think this whole period we've been through with respect to employment is um is just a distorted distorted outlier and uh It'll be interesting to see where these levels end up uh, not not too far in the distant future or the near future i should say so i do think that there's a there's some pent-up demand again we talked last week about the the water heater and and you could apply, apply the same thing to automotive electronic chips and stuff like that and i i do think that we're going to see a, a staggered incremental recovery that will be uh, somewhat persistence now obviously that all goes out the window with some type of cataclysmic event um when it comes to elevated or slightly high certainly not very high but slightly high levels of potential downside you've got the the morning star price to fair value here at uh, at least over the last several years relative highs you do have my par at you know, not distressingly low, but relatively low levels. That means that the average stock is less likely to be on sale. More on that in a second. And the one area that is slightly uh, concerning, uh, the value line arithmetic index has been sufficiently hot enough over the last several months that it is now tracking at a relative strength index approaching 80. Anytime we've hit 80 or 80-ish in the past, we have had that moment in time and I apologize for this being so so small, but I wanted to get all these thoughts on one page. These plateaus or consolidation that Kim was talking about, that shouldn't surprise any of us if that were to materialize here in the not too distant future and persist for you know, a few months, if not a couple of years. Well, and one thing I can um, really notice, Mark, is when you're looking at that graph that you were writing on, when the RSI got up to those 80s, notice how afterwards, 
put a put a line. Yeah, you've got there, but look at the end of it when it gets be below 80 for the very first time. It started in that consolidation uh, metric, and then it goes on for months. Yeah. So as you say, you don't know. I feel there will be a consolidation time. I don't know how long it's going to last. I also know that there's 52-week highs, 52-week lows, and I love having my alerts on it when my those good quality stocks have some crazy thing happened to them and i'm able to pick it up because sometimes i do to go to nasdaq.com and i can look up the 52 week highs and the 52 week lows and and see what's pulling back yeah i'm just tinkering away with the chart just to make your point a, a little more carefully what kim is saying you know we we jumped up here above 70 which is overbought and uh actually took out 80 which we think is really overbought and again you see this flat spot which lasted the better part of a year here back in 15 16 same thing again right here um fairly recent history showing that flat spot which lasted a couple of years and again um you can see it on on this chart here how incredible the performance has been over the last couple of years now and we have found those levels again so consolidation i think i think of it as a price plateau however you want to think about it uh it uh and you have those great a quality of a stock when you have those great quality stocks within your portfolio and they don't have too much leverage they're paying dividends and so you sit back reinvest your dividends and watch your fundamentals and go live your life yeah, and that's kind of the last area I wanted to talk about a little bit here. We are in a, in a moment where uh, we discussed over the last couple of weeks putting together upside-downside ratios and zoning for the companies in value line. This happens to be for just the companies here in this week's update batch, it's issue six of the value line investment survey. Um, I think there's seven companies that qualify as buys. And uh, as you can see, a whole bunch of holds and more than usual sells. We're going to watch these a little bit more closely just to kind of see what uh, what kicks up and, you know, how this kind of pans out. You know, I would call it severe if this well was empty. I don't think we've ever seen that. Um, going back in my 30 or 40 years doing this, I don't think we've ever seen that where we've had absolutely no stocks in the buy zone so we'll see going forward in that spirit i uh, just wanted to make everybody aware in the weekly this week at manifest the weekly update actually did add that graphic to the the weekly update so you can see there's a thin slice of companies that are in the buy zone and uh, also added companies that qualify as triple play qualifiers thought you might find that interesting i'm just tinkering you know you never know what we might uh what we might find and uh, there are a number of companies now with a caution i would give you is again a triple play qualifier is a company that one has a potential for pe expansion um the thing that you need to know is within the manifest investing database we're just simply asking the question is the future pe greater than the current pe yes or no so if clorox has a pe today of 20.1 and the long-term forecasted PE is 20.2, the answer to that question is yes. So you can have a fairly thin margin. We're going to demonstrate that here in a minute. Same thing is true when it comes to profitability. Could be cranking away at a profit, uh, net profit margin of 13%. If the long-term projected net margin is 13.5, again, not caring about how big that difference is, just simply that the 13.5 is greater than the 13, the answer to that would also be yes. And the third qualifier for the triple play, at least in the manifest database at this point, is a manifest rank greater than 90. So that's a combination of quality and uh, return forecast. So in the case of a, a Clorox showing up, we'll take a look here in a minute, it's not dramatically sexy or exciting, but it does uh, satisfy that manifest rank greater than 90 so it's in the top 10 percent of all companies 
with respect to those two powerful characteristics of return forecast and quality. So I may tweak that a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure I want to go to the extent of just relying on return forecast. That's the traditional triple play. We'll see. But just so you know, that's how this triple play was formed. Those are the companies that Value Line featured as above average returns. And you can see that we, as we do every week, the companies that have uh, had boosted forecasts are materially stronger. Those that have had weakened forecasts are materially weaker. And uh, here's a look at Clorox. Clorox for, forecast for the three to five year period actually did go up slightly. Um, I don't usually include them when it's this slight, but uh, I just felt like talking about Clorox. Clorox has been appearing on a number of our screens. We keep scratching our head as to, you know, why is it showing up? And I, I think I have at least one answer here. You can see that it is pretty much up straight and parallel, even if the up is a gentle slope to the upside. Uh, you can see a 4.5% growth rate for the company, judging by the, the red dotted line here. Uh, improving profitability down here at the bottom steadily improving profitability into that low teens area very nice picture uh, a pe that's uh, certainly merits being somewhere in the low 20s you can see the value line took it from a 21 to a, a 22 with this week's update and uh, so we're looking at a return forecast again not dramatically sexy or exciting but not bad when the average stock is right around six percent very high quality and uh, what is interesting about this one is the uh, the return on on value does check out pretty well you can see all the components of the return on value calculation right there uh, decent financial strength really nice interest rate on that which they borrow and the two things which jump off this page as far as timing right now because again i think the theme for clorox and i'd like to hear your thoughts on this one kim too is i think this could be you were just talking about this this could be an, uh, a really nice place to hide. And why do I say that? Uh, the relative strength index means it's probably oversold or it's getting pretty close to oversold. Then I look up here and I see an upside downside ratio of 11. That simply means that it is now trading closer to the 52 week low. So we're in a situation where the company's uh, attractively priced at least with respect to its historical ranges and uh, it has been oversold to the downside again keep in mind that it had such a tremendous jump up here i, I mean it, it, it looks small here but it's actually pretty big where you can see that that sales figure for 2021 projected to peak above the line kind of like kilroy was here um it's an interesting situation it is going to plateau off in sales but uh, i do think we're going to be cleaning our hands for some time to come. Your thoughts, Kim? Well, I certainly agree. Um, the number one is this pandemic pandemic, and this virus has changed people's behavior and recognize on how they should not touch everybody and not worry. So I think that it, you're, we're, we're gonna have a habit that is developed with people so that we are gonna wash our hands more and clean more, but uh, I think that the stock itself, the price has been oversold because people are wondering, will this continue? And that'll be it because um, I think that habit is going to continue and people may have pulled money out because they're, they basically don't, don't think the stock will continue to move forward and, you know, it's run up and let's grab my profit and leave. But I think this habit has developed and it will continue. Now there's a lot of questions for you, Mark, on about this because Kay's asking, is it correct that she's seeing the upside downside for Clor Clorox is 11? Yeah, it's 11, according to this calculation right here. Again, and the the low price is at 173, the current price is at 178-ish. Um, so we're we're talking about uh, pretty close to the low side of the the upside downside ratio, and uh, the future price is now at two thirty nine, so fairly fairly well uh, seated at the low end of the range. 
Right, and then the other thing is someone is asking, um, these are not pro forma numbers. Uh, these are PEs as they've been reported for Clorox, right? Well, the PEs that are shown here are forecast numbers from Value Line. So yeah. And, and, yeah. And then um, the recent three quarters of elevated earnings could be skewed due to what's been happening. And going forward, people really don't know. So this is where you have to make your own judgment. Yeah, and I, I think what I would call I would call the situation that some some investors are seeing um, comparable to a Moderna. And I, I think there's a pretty pretty good uh, downside drop in Moderna today because first of all, when when the big wave of vaccinations is done, I mean at least that component of their business has to trail off, and I'm pretty sure Novavax was announced as a potential approved, or an, I'm pretty sure their efficacy checked in at greater than ninety percent, and they're likely to be approved as a manufacturer or provider for future vaccines. So there's a whole class of companies out there like Moderna that will have this huge swell in 2020, 2021, that uh, that is not sustainable for at least not for all of them. And, uh, and the competition is, is pretty intense, you know, for providing that stuff. So you're going to have, you know, kind of the, almost like a hump in a camel for a, a number of those companies. I think Clorox will have a fairly small hump and uh, will persist, uh, is more likely to persist at the higher levels than in many other companies in that realm. This is my my personal opinion. So, Mark, this is Herb. Yeah, Herb. Are you, are you concerned about the cash on hand being lower and the debt going up? I mean, it looks like they're they're losing cash on hand and they're still going up in debt. So I think that could be why the the uh, stock is down like it is. Yeah, I think those are fairly normal fluctuations in cash, though. If you go back and look at it more carefully over time, um, you, perhaps they did spend a little bit more money doing something here. But those are those are relatively small numbers, you know, from their perspective. But with the payroll protection, I'm surprised that their cash on hand is lower. I'm surprised that it hasn't really gone up quite a bit. I can't speak to that, but yeah, uh, there's yeah. a there's a number of companies that well, there's a, a again capital structure is kind of all over the place. It's one of the reasons that we really like the projected return on value analysis because you have companies that are paying off debt uh, significantly. Um, in, in other companies which are, are are basically taking on more debt because of the low interest rates there's a whole lot of stuff going on in that uh, arena but these are fairly actually actually fairly steady state for for Clorox certainly something to keep an eye on if I'm the stock watcher for this company I'm, I'm with you 100 percent herb be watching that carefully all right so we, shall we press on we shall. All right. Last last week we talked about this bridge or this notion of calculating economic drift. And true to form, a few of you wrote to me and and pointed out uh, another way to look at this, which might help some of the attendees. Again, the, what we told you last week is that for a number of companies, and Clorox would almost qualify. Um, we're comparing the sales trend versus the current twelve months trailing 12 months actual numbers and watching for large variations. So we are actually monitoring that and, and kicking it into gear. And we explained it last week, but a number of you wrote to me and said, why don't you explain it this way? So here's basically what we're doing. We are looking at, again, take a look at, in this case, Clorox. And here's that Kilroy is here uh, situation up here, the bubble up to the upside here where the, the trailing 12 month sales is actually noticeably above the long-term trend. The long-term trend is shown here by our arrow and we're calculating this difference. When this difference gets too large, uh, if you're calculating from here for, for, your, for your 
stock selection guide calculations, you're probably overestimating. The same could be true from the other side of the picture where companies have gone into a depression mode. Um, so it, it works both ways. That variance cuts both ways. All we're doing is calculating at what point in time or at what point in, uh, in terms of this difference are we switching to the trend. Now, I use the trend all the time, virtually 100% for all the companies that I do. Um, but I know that some of you, you use the annuals and the quarters. We're just pointing out that that can lead to uh, potentially misleading calculations when it gets too far adrift. That's what we mean by economic drift. You can see here the, the low stock price, obviously very near its 52-week low, if not right at it. So that's all we're doing. We are monitoring for the size of that difference in kicking in the trend calculation in the manifest database to, uh, again, because what we care about the most is a representative, credible, slash viable number for the long-term forecast. And we certainly want to try to remove that distortion. So that's all we're doing, kicking that, kicking that trend calculation into place when it makes sense to do so. All right, and with that, let's go ahead and turn it over. Kim has a new book for us that she's uh, discovered with her book club. Um, this book just came out mm, probably a couple, about a couple months ago. Um, we're reading uh, a couple chapters every week and then having a great uh, hour-long discussion on it. And I'm thoroughly enjoying this because it's, you always want to learn from the best and these are these guys are people who've had you know 300 percent returns so what are their methods to be successful and one of the big things that um really came, has come across to me is if you have those stocks in your portfolio that are compounding machines and you think to yourself will this stock be around in 20 years well we always need this these are a great way to find out if this is the kind of stock you want in your portfolio going forward there's a, a couple there's three or four really good youtube um videos out there if you don't want to read the book and get a short shorter synopsis on it that you can uh, look at there and Mark, didn't you tell me that uh, you found an article or something in AAII? Yeah, the most recent uh, American Association uh, journal includes a discussion. It's how the, how the world's greatest investors think. And I wasn't able to link up to AAII on my computer. I was going to see if that article has been made public. Uh, I might excerpt it in the forum. I'll, I'll find those YouTube videos and, and uh, include them in the forum. But yeah, I, I think it's a great book. I have read a number of these commentaries uh, over the years from all the work by Charlie Ellis and others in the, the, the academic world that follows this stuff. Um, I do want to take a closer look at, at many of these. Notice that Joel Greenblatt, he's the inspiration behind our project, projected return on value work you know shows up here but there are some very accomplished investors in the book and uh i look forward to refreshing some of the stuff that i've experienced over the years and it was very interesting to uh, have a couple lectures where monice parai has said that because of this book he's actually changed some of his methodology on how to choose a stock in the past he would always go for those cigarette or cigar butt stocks recognizing that they're undervalued till they got to full value now he's also recognizing he wants those compounders going forward who just will keep on compounding out like um southwest costco uh markel berkshire hathaway uh, going forward. And so I think uh, for myself, I'm going to, as I've, I've been reading this book, I'm wanting to make a little um, list of stocks to add to my potential pounce list. Because there's new names in there I haven't heard before. Cool. 
All right, so I, I think it's going to be worthy of being added to this collection. We'll make that judgment later, but this is just a reminder of some of the books that we have found most helpful over the years. Uh, some of them are timeless. Some of them are on themes that can be extrapolated into investing excellence, but uh, some good books all around. And again, you can go back to the sessions from last uh, the last quarter of last year into the first few months of this year, and we talked about many of these in greater detail. Here's a reminder that we do archive the presentations, all of the webcasts. These happen to be all of the successful investing conference entries. Uh, we put all the roundtables and the bull sessions on there too. If you go to YouTube, just search on Manifest Investing, you will find it. We would uh, love for you to subscribe. Make sure you like the things when you like them and let us know. And uh, as Ann Manning did earlier, uh, feel free to suggest a topic for future consideration. And with that, I'll go ahead and close with uh, an another very famous bridge and uh, a statistic that came to us this morning via Morning Brew, which uh, again points to this notion kind of going back to that busy slide a few slides ago that we are fairly rapidly roaring back and California is not an exception to this. Uh, although California has a massive mountain of challenges ahead of it in a number of ways, um, they certainly are uh, doing better and uh, we wanna all do better. So we hope for the best. California is a great state. I'd hate to see it struggle uh, too much. Your thoughts, Kim? I really think that there's a lot further that the market will go and I haven't been complaining at all on how it's done so far. So uh, we just have to keep our noses down, maybe keep our hands away from our portfolios and find those compounders. When we do have a little bit of pullback, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we have, you know, a 10% pullback or anything and just watch and wait and make sure everyone has the pounce list ready. Absolutely. And as for me, I, I really enjoy days like this when the market is off slightly by, a, I don't know, it was down almost a percent there for a while. Now it's down a little bit less than that, but our portfolios are actually doing pretty well today. And one of the major contributors is A2 Milk. So even A2, even A2 Milk can have its day, apparently. So good stuff. All right, and with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and shut down the recording. We'll stick around and see if there's any other questions. Thanks, everybody. See you again in a week from now.